Welcome to another episode of One on One with Mitch LaFawn. I am, of course, your host, Mitch LaFawn. Joining me this week, another Mitch, Mitch Weissman, original Paul McCartney in Beatlemania, went on to write uh, on Kiss Asylum and a bunch of other stuff, played on the Kiss solo albums. And, of course, J.R. Smalling. He was one of the original Kiss crew guys. He wrote a new book called Out on the Streets, detailing his time with the band in the early days. And, of course, joining me as a co-host is Matt Starr, current drummer for Mr. Big, or at least touring drummer, uh, Burning Rain. If you haven't checked out that band, you absolutely must. And, of course, having played on Ace Fraley's uh, great comeback album, Space Invader. So so there's sort of a kiss connection with all three guys this week. Good day, Matt. Yeah, hey, how are you? Yeah, so... You, you've got your own Kiss story. Yeah. A little piece, a little piece of Kiss story, yeah. yeah. And hey, I want to say to everybody listening, you know, I don't know what time it is wherever you're listening, but Mitch is burning the midnight oil to do this <laughs> tonight, so I, okay. I, I appreciate it. And it's a dedicated rock and roll, uh, true, rock true, and roll guy here. Trooper yeah. here, yeah. Listen, it's it's we're getting to Christmas time. I'm heading out on vacation, so we got to get all these shows. Done, compiled, edited together, and then loaded up so that while I'm somewhere, they can be delivered to you, the uh, the faithful listener. So, um, you know, um, you know a little bit about Jr. You've been reading the other Kiss book, Nothing to Lose. Uh, I don't know mm-hmm. if you've had a chance to read Out on the Street. If you haven't, it just came out. It, it is a great, great book. Lots of minutia, lots of great stories. Uh, you know, and it's great to find out that afterwards, Jr. went and worked with Ted Nugent, uh, Aerosmith at Lieber Krebs. Um, you know, great stuff. Um, what are your thoughts yeah, he, on all this? Yeah, no, he, I, I really enjoyed his uh, all his excerpts in the Nothing to Lose book. And um, yeah, the first play, the first show I played with Ace in New York, Jr. I remember seeing the guest list go by, and his name was on the guest list. And I was like, oh, man, it's so cool. And he didn't make it out to that show, but I know he's been out to some eight shows since, and he, uh, he's intro to a couple shows, and uh, super cool. But, yeah, no, it's, it, it's cool to get the crew's perspective, too, because um, – and just how dedicated they were to the band, and it really was an army, you know, and, and, and Kiss was, was their guys, and they were going to do everything they had to, to to take care of them, make sure they got what they needed as far as production, make sure – they weren't getting shortchanged on the lights or, you know, the PA and all that kind of stuff. And it's, um, it, it's, it's cool, man. I think it really takes that kind of uh, organization to make it, you know? And, and I think that it's something, you know, the kiss guys, they had that dedication and it's contagious. And so when you're, when you have that level of conviction, you know, you attract people who have the same. And so it, it is a very cool thing. I think it's a really special relationship. It really is. Now, you know, you're on tour now and you've been on tour for the last five or ten years of your life. Are, are roadies and, and the guys behind as dedicated to their bands or is it pretty much like changing socks every week? There's a new guy and it's just like, eh, I got paid better somewhere else. I'm out of here. Or do you still have that dedicated roadie? And I think answer it depends. Answer carefully. <laughs> yeah, right. All roadies are awesome. No, you know, it's... It, it depends on the situation. I mean, you know, if you watch, um, like I was watching this Iron Maiden documentary and it, and it showed the road crew and it was like 1976 to present, 1979 to 2010. Like these guys stayed. And so Maiden's a band, they work, you know, and they're always working. So, I mean, it does come down to that where there, there may be a, um, a level of dedication, but it's like, man, if you guys aren't going to go out for the next two years, you know, this roadie's got to go out and work and then maybe he develops a relationship with another band. So I think you get both, but like when I did the Mr. Big Run, um, you know, they had techs that had been with them for quite a while and, um, and they just enjoy working with them because it's just, again, that, that level of exceptionalism. And so it attracts people who want to, want to work with that, you know? Yeah. And I think that's also sort of what Metallica does. As far as I know, they, they've got some guys, some lifers that have been there for 30 some years and, They've never teched for anybody else. And it's just like, this is my band. And the band is like, this is my crew. And they stick with them. Now, 
Of course, uh, J.R. talks about it in his book, and he talks about it in the interview, that he was there at the beginning with KISS. They were building this machine. It was starting to fire on all cylinders, and then, whoop, the shoe dropped, and KISS sort of came in and cleaned house, got rid of everybody around 1976, just before they got to that other level. And, uh, of course, uh, he was disappointed, but, hey, got to go off with Aerosmith, got to go... He, Became the, tur the, the uh, merch guy for Aerosmith. Got to do stuff with Nugent. Hey, you know, it's not exactly like he was thrown out on the streets, right? Yeah. No, you know, and it's interesting, too, how some bands do that. I know, like, when Aerosmith got back together uh, in the 80s. And, um, you know, and, and uh, was it Tim Collins who was their manager? Yeah, Tim. And, you know, and they would just, they would clean house a lot. And that's what they felt they needed to do to keep things rolling. And so it's everybody's got to do what they got to do. I don't, was that a Glickman Marx thing or was that a Bill O'Coin thing with the with the house cleaning that went on? I can't remember. That was Bill O'Coin. Uh, Glickman Marx, yeah. as far as I know, didn't come on board till 79, 80. So 76 mm -hmm. had to be Bill or yeah, John Delaney Bill. or, you know, whoever. Right, but, right. Uh, hey, you know. Uh, so why don't we sit back and listen to uh, Mitch Weissman and uh, J.R. Smalling reminisce about KISS, being around KISS, being friends with KISS, being road members, etc., etc. Um, what do you think? Here's uh, Mitch and J.R. I'm speaking with J.R. Smalling, who just wrote the original KISS crew out on the streets books, and joining me for this talk is Mitch Weissman known as uh, Paul McCartney in Beatlemania, but also friends with the Kiss guys for many, many years. Good day, boys. Hey, good day. Hi, guys. So, hey, how you doing? <laughs> so, you know... Oh, uh, two, two Mitches, no waiting. How you guys doing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, it'll get confusing, but we'll try not to walk over each other, I'm sure. <laughs> well, it sounds like my other podcast, which is Metal Raps, which I do with Mark Striegel and Mitch Joel. So the, the double Mitch thing I, I, I'm used to. Oh, um, I love it. So I've interviewed you both individually about your KISS days and, and, and working in and around the band, so I thought it'd be fun to, to bring you together. But let, let me start with JR. Um, just quickly about the book, Out on the Streets. Just what compelled you to put together the, the story of what happened behind the scenes? Uh, several reasons. I think first and foremost, Mitch, it was, uh, it was the fans. You know, they have uh, been uh, real backers and supporters of, of the original crew from day one. Um, and uh, fortunately, thanks to them, they've, they've been on our case to, to write this book for years now. And uh, we finally uh, took the time, got it together, and, uh, and, and, and put our thoughts down on paper. And uh, what, you, uh, what you get is... Um, the result of, of, of those efforts. So, you know, we all great that uh, vote of thanks and confidence to, to the fans for uh, staying on us to get it done. Yeah, I'm really glad they did. Now, uh, Mitch, you were in in and around the, the, you know, the Kiss solo album, 77, 78. D did you and JR meet? Did you know each other? Were you friends? Did you hang out? I can't remember, JR, were you gone by then? Or uh, you weren't working on Gene solo album at that point. No, I was gone. Uh, the crew was was gone as of uh, June seventy six. Right, um, right. You know, but uh, but like like we mentioned, uh, you know, you, you and I, uh, Mitch, were wound up at, at Libra Krebs. Uh, yeah, the, I, house, I the halcyon days of Steve, David, Stephen, Joe. I mean, everybody. Yeah. Insane. Uh, I mean, the fact that we survived that office is, is enough. Well, explain this to me here, because th this is why I brought you two together, because you're going to give me stuff that I never would have thought. Lieber Krebs was uh, Aerosmith management, right? And the infamous management that either screwed them or some, just some kind of rumors or whatever. Is, is that correct? Uh, they had not only Aerosmith, they had uh, Bootsy, Parliament Funkadelic. They had uh, hmm. Frank Marino and Mahogany Rush, which goes back to that thing that you posted, which which band in Canada, and I went Frank Marino, Hoggedy Rush, because yeah. we knew them. I mean, Local these boy. were guys around the office. Um, I think by the time you went working there, it weren't the, the end of the New York Dolls were hanging around the office as well, JR. I mean, I was a kid starting out in 1976 in June, and, the la and I met 
the I met the Kiss guys actually when they were rehearsing for a world tour at about the same time, which didn't go out till '77. At SIR, they made us go through all those rehearsals, like I told you about. But that office was filled with more people than you could imagine. With David's, with David's um, political pensions, we had uh, what's his name that ran for president. Um, Oh, forgot, all these the political people would be coming in. Bill Withers came in. All these different people came through that office. You didn't know who you were going to open the door on. And JR, yeah, what were you doing there? I was doing uh, various and assorted uh, projects. I was uh, Aerosmith's uh, tour uh, merchandising manager uh, for a year. I did uh, tour accounting for, uh, for Ted Nugent for about a year. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> yeah, <imagine>. and, and, <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was great times, man. And, and and like Mitch just mentioned, you know, Bootsy was there. I worked for Bootsy, and George Clinton was was there as well. But it was really an unbelievable because, you know, Stephen they they managed um, not only the band that we mentioned, but they were also the U.S. representative for a lot of foreign acts like Scorpions, really? uh, Golden Earring. I did some work with. Uh, they had Focus for a while, didn't they? As well, they, they had Focus. Had uh, DC, I mean, oh, yeah. it, was zoo, it was a zoo. <laughs> and really, yeah. really, really, really great stuff going on all the time. Let me yeah. ask you that right then, there, Jr. So you're you're with the Kiss guys, and you're you're doing basically roadie work, from what I can tell. You're you know you're bodyguarding and roadie. How did you get into the finances of a tour and with Ted Nugent, and what qualified you for that? And basically, what does that mean for a fan who doesn't know? Well, I had I had been on the road. I think we, we spoke about this previously. I, I had been on the road before KISS, uh, like Mitch mentioned, with groups like Focus, uh, um, uh, Golden Earring. I worked with an English group called Tranquility. I saw um, them. You got Tranquility. I went to Carnegie Mellon University in oh. Pittsburgh. I saw the Focus show there in the 70s, and then Tranquility came in. The, one of the best glam bands I ever saw in my life, and that guy's voice was fantastic. And they, they and uh, everything was in satin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, they 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 were a great band. But we did a lot of gigs uh, on on the Tranquility tour with uh, with David Bowie. Some gigs with Yes. There was a, there was a bunch of stuff. But I I gained a lot of experience uh, working out in New York as as like the go to guy when these bands would come over from Europe, uh, put their tours together, and uh, they needed a, a a person that was uh, hip to the states and how things went. So I, I got to work with a lot of those bands in, in, in their very early stages. Um, uh, after the Kiss time, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, as a roadie, I actually was, was hired uh, with the understanding that uh, as soon as the band had enough money, the band being Kiss, you know, had it together enough that I would actually uh, stop uh, working on stage as a stage manager and as a production manager. Do we take over the road management spot because I had the experience from what I had done previously. Right. And that's what happened after the first year or so. I, you know, I was able to get off the stage and leave the gear behind and, and, and start road managing the band. Uh, but in road managing a band, you know, you, you, you're involved in a lot of different uh, things. You wear a lot of different hats from collecting the, the, the money for the shows, paying salaries, paying per diems, paying the hotels, and you know, all that stuff you're dealing making with. Sure, making sure the band gets there, you know. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You're booking yeah. transportation and you're, you're, you're making sure that the uh, press and publicity interviews and everything like that goes on. So it's really an opportunity to learn um, a, a lot about, uh, or really everything that there is to learn about, about uh, traveling with a band on the road, especially when, when it's a successful band that uh, ascended as quickly as Kiss did. So, um, like I said, after having worked uh, at Libra Krebs and, and successfully uh, worked with the Aerosmith merchandising for a year, keeping their books straight and accounting for everything, I, I was uh, asked to uh, to do the same for, for Ted Nugent. And it was really interesting because um, with the roster that Libra Krebs had, they were one of the first management companies to actually be able to put on their own almost festivals, come, you know, with acts just from their from their roster. Right. So it, it was it wasn't unusual to have, like Mitch mentioned, you know, a Mahogany Rush and a Ted Nugent and and an ACDC or 
or Aerosmith or whatever, you know, four, five, and six acts, and they're all leave the Krebs groups. Uh, wasn't, Cal, they, wasn't Cal Jam mostly that also? That's exactly what that was, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You know? Really? And, Cal, and Cal Jam 83? No, Cal Jam 74. 78? 70, well, all 78. Of them. 78. 78, yeah. yeah that's 78, I, I, 78 was, I was doing Beatlemania out here, and I didn't, never got to see anybody play. I guess it's one of those things you're working six days a week and whatever it is. Um, but the Cal Jam thing is because everybody's out in California for that. I think that Cal Jam is where, uh, what was it? Um, Jeff Beck came on stage and did Train Kept Her Own for Joe Perry's birthday. I mean, all this yeah. stuff, all this legendary stuff occurred out there, and it was, uh, it was. Uh, did, did you run that whole thing? Were you got there by then, still or not? I'm sorry, you broke up. Jr. You did you over. did you were you involved with that Cal Jam thing out there then? Did you run that whole thing? I I wouldn't say I ran it, but I was, you know, in my position, I was I was a major part of what was going on. Yeah, between um, you and Kelly keeping all those acts in one piece. By the way, Derek St. Holmes, I'm sure, sends his regards. I'm, I told, I don't know if I told Mitch the other day. <laughs> the fun part about our lives is when the phone rings, you never know who's going to be on the end of it. Right. As I'm yeah. walking down the aisle here to get somebody a guitar, I hear a guy in a car going, Mitch, Derek St. Holmes. I'm going, says, I was going through my phone. I hadn't gone through the M's going, who haven't I called? So it's so much fun to when guys, you know, we've all kept touch with each other for years. And the phone rings, it's like... Uh, you never know who's going to be there. Oh, yeah. it's, it's kind of warm feeling seeing Stephen the other night at the Rolling Stones book thing. It's uh, I've taken over the conversation, so I'm stopping. But go back, go back to what you were doing. It's just that's our no, lives. No, no, not at all. But see, but that's that's a perfect example of it. You know, um, yeah. the, the bands that, that were that were all uh, under the same roof and representation. You know, or some of the most iconic acts uh, to come out of the seventies, and uh, yeah. it was just uh, just a major, major uh, rush. How do you think uh, Lieber Krebs managed to get everybody? Because, I mean, you did have Bill O'Coin, you did have a bunch of other managers out there. How, how did they manage to corral all the biggest names? Well, you know, when Kiss first hit the road, one of the first gigs that we did... Yeah, and why didn't Kiss up. end up with Lieber Krebs, by the way? Well, no, they were, they were very well ensconced and very happy with, with Bill O'Coin. Right. Uh, they had seen that Bill, you know... Uh, did what he had to do, and he laid his credit card on the line very famously to to uh, to keep them on the road for the first year or so. And there was there was a great allegiance. It was like a big family. It was really the early Kiss days was really more of a family type uh, affair than it was a straight you know business relationship. So uh, it doesn't it doesn't surprise me that uh, that Kiss didn't wind up with uh, with, with Libra Krebs, but. Um, you know, like I say, Aerosmith was already headlining when Kiss hit the road, and when when an act is uh, when a, when a management company is, is managing a major act, um, then other acts naturally seek them out because they've seen that they were able to shepherd them to the headline status, and you know they want the same kind of care and attention. So it was very easy for for uh, David Krebs and Steve Weaver to. Uh, to grow the roster to what it became. Um, and they had, you know, great, great people supporting, great people. They had people like them. you. They, they had people like you. They had Louis Levin. They had other guys, that knew, Kelly, Bob Kelleher, God bless him. I mean, yeah. all sorts of people, and I'm forgetting half the damn names already. It's terrible. Um, in, the account, in the accounting field, uh, Pally, Bruce Pally, all those guys, I mean, keeping everything yeah. together, you know. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I say, I mean, it was, it was a machine, a well-oiled machine, and with the uh, with the roster again, um, all of the bands that were on the way up did not have to uh, suffer as as a lot of bands did because they were they were able to go out and open and special guests for the headline acts that we were fans managed and it it relieved a lot of the tensions and a lot of the uh, anxiety of you know we got an album coming out you know who who can we go on tour with that kind of thing because it, it was all built in. It was great. Well, let me ask you this, Jay. You, you mentioned that Kiss starting off was like a family. Was there an event or a day or a moment when you realized it's not a family anymore? It's now about business? What, was it when they let you go? Was, was there an attitude <laughs> backstage? Was there... I mean, was there a moment that Gene come in at some point and say, all right, folks, like, 
When did it become business and no longer family? And that, no, it, it was it was a family uh, in my mind anyway. Right until uh, the day I got fired, um, which you know happened uh, totally out of the blue. There was no uh, there was no warning. There was no rhyme or reason or, or you know given. Um, it was just hey, you know, it's not working anymore. And how could it not have been working anymore? In, in two and a half years, we went from from clubs to. Uh, they headlining, you know, major, uh, major arenas and the like. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put you on the spot and, and, and ask you to name names, but there's always somebody that is looking. And even in my career or stuff like that, there's always somebody that's looking to oust the person that they feel the most threatened by. And it doesn't necessarily sure. have to be the band, Mitch. It doesn't have right. to be Gene or Paul or right. Eric I mean, or anybody or, or Ace or Peter. It can be somebody who sees, sees the threat of, if I don't get rid of this guy, I'm not moving up anymore. Right, another tour manager or, or the sound guy or, yeah, or, or exactly. Bill O'Coin or whatever. Could have been Bill's boyfriend. Who the hell yeah. knows who it was? I mean, you know, any, could have been anything. And yet all his boyfriends that I met were always very nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so, specific, so. Specifics are in the book, Mitch. Right. Yeah, it's so very, I'll read that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, 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 it's very well outlined in the book without naming any names. Um, here on in this particular discussion, um, right. yeah, individuals, uh, entities, shall we say, came in and wished to exercise uh, their their power within the organization, and um, things changed rapidly. And the real for the real uh, Kiss fans from from back in those days, they will say themselves that uh, the, the the attitude went from being a, a rock and roll. Uh, party type, uh, straight ahead, hardcore kind of vibe, to what it later became as a, as a business, as a, as a merchandising marketing entity, and 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 it and it changed virtually overnight. I want to, uh, if I can, just bring you to 2014 for a second. There, there's sort of two stories that are going on in the Kiss world. First is Ace Frehley and the Space Invader album. It, it's getting a lot of positive reviews. He's getting a lot of positive press for his shows lately. Have either of you heard the album? And just sort of, what's your take on Ace being this sober guy, putting out an album that's well-received, and just doing it the right way these days? Um, Mitch, I'll leave that to you. Let's see, okay. I, um, I've always had a soft spot for Ace, knucklehead that he is. I've never had that much communication with him um, that much other than a few late night phone calls or wandering into the China club in the eighties with Anton, um, all kinds of other social interventions, uh, interactions and stuff like that. And he's always been very nice and friendly in that way. Um, you know, when, when we're, we're all coherent and could talk to each other. Um, I think the fact that he's doing something now past all the fun and all the stuff that we all make of him or the world in general may think, or Paul and Gene make, um, may, maybe less on, Gene's part, unless you, unless there's a, unless there's a mic in front of him, you ask him point blank. But he's always been very kind. But I was there. Those are the years. The years when I was friends with them. So the first time was when in '76, getting ready for that tour, and they all came to watch us do Beatles for four hours at SIR on 54th Street. Mm -hmm. And and when I say all, it really wasn't. It was Paul and Gene saying, "Play this one. Play this one. Play this one." Ace came in once, and then you never saw him again. Peter kept running into the tracksuit, going now, now, and everybody going no, not now. Um, <laughs> and then the next, the next day in in the little in Studio B, we went in to watch them play, and Ace blew up his his Marshall head, and Gene popped the bass string, and Big John, who was still there, ushered us out the damn door before all hell broke loose. And apparently, I found out from Lydia Chris nights later at uh, JP's down. I uh, no, um uh, not JP's, someplace down on 14th Street. Ashley Powell, Pownell's place down there. Um, Ashley, yeah. Remember Ashley? Yeah. So uh, he, that was a place you could go into. There's a disco upstairs. There's a restaurant and a bar downstairs. And you'd never know. I would, I would be sitting at a table, and Tommy Bowen would come in and nod out at the table next to me. But uh, that's, uh, I mean, it was a great place, but Ashley's was great. And Lydia came up. That's when she introduced me. You don't know me, but I'm Peter Chris, I'm Chris's wife. I want you to know the boys were so upset when their gear blew up because they felt like they were playing for the Beatles because we played for them four hours before. Right. 76, I think everything was still pretty cool with them as people. Um, for sure. You know, everything was really cool. Then. In the 80s with Ace, when they, they recorded that, the Elder up at his studio just to try to help him make money and stuff like that. Um, I remember talking to Gene and saying it was 
going okay up there, but there was a lot of Ezrin was still being Ezrin, and things were still happening around them that he didn't didn't like, but as long as it didn't affect well, what was going on. So well, was Ezrin that. really being Ezrin? Because if, if you look back now, and it's, it's documented, we're not dealing with rumor, apparently yeah. there was a lot of cocaine and That's other drugs. That's what I meant by Ezrin. Well, I wasn't going to say it, but that was what I meant by Ezrin being Ezrin, apparently. Right. Something and, I, didn't, and, I didn't know. But, that but, was a hard record for them. Because um, when fans hear Ezrin's being Ezrin, we understand it as being he's controlling, he's telling the band what to do. He's, he's producing the way he produces. Yeah. You mean it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like on automatic, but on that record, they were dealing with Ace's foibles, Ezrin having the stuff on the console, uh, which is you know nothing new we haven't seen. Um, but the thing is, apparently that was a rough, rough thing. And they, and they took themselves in the new romantic direction and they changed everything. And that was, I think they're really trying to just figure out what the hell they were doing at the point in time, trying anything. And at the same time, going back to new guys or old guys like Ezrin, we'll try this direction, but let's bring in somebody we know who knows, knows our music and know what to do. And that didn't fit. The Elder was an interesting record. It was definitely an experimental turn. My favorite song on the album is World Without Heroes, which Gene wrote with, with Lou Reed, but it, I also told him at the time, you're missing, you're missing a bridge. It came out of the guitar song and went right to the end. You know, what the hell is that? So they, <laughs> they knew that you know, he had his ideas and that things were there, but I don't, it's, and, and Paul covered the Tony Powers' Odyssey, uh, and uh, it, was an, it was an interesting choice, but the, no, the public wouldn't have it. Yeah, so now, what's your take on on Ace now in Space Invaders? Because I mean, he's had a very good 2014. I mean, we, we've you know the media has made fun of him over the last ten years. He's yeah. lazy. He's this. He got thrown out of. But this year, you got to give him credit. He he really put it yeah. together. That was your original question, and yeah, it's true. He definitely pulled it together. He, it's funny. His the guy who co-wrote the first single is uh, John Ostrowski or John Astronomy. Mm -hmm. um, who I first got me to be on that uh, the uh, Fraley's Comet CD, which I, I had was a so, part in, and I was so happy for John. But basically, John is doing what he's always done for everybody; he's taking care of everybody, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that worked. And I think the fact that uh, Richie Scarlett is back helps. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it, you know, John, of course, John Regan and those guys have Four by Faith, Todd, and stuff like that. So, right. I which think I which I put together, yeah, which well, is which is then you helped. you should be congratulated because that's that's a good project for them. Um, mm -hmm. I think what's really good is that they are, he's out doing it. If he really is serious about doing a Kiss Covers record, he should, because he's having fun now is what it sounds like. Yes, he really is. Now, the For other sure. story of 2014, and, and I don't want to get uh, nasty here, but Paul has taken to Twitter and he's expressed his opinions, which he's never done before, and I think it's sort of a shock for fans where he said the Macy's Parade screwed him over and the Hall of Fame screwed him over. And... and you know, it's fine that Paul says that. It's just that over the last 39 years, he hasn't said that. He, he's given very polite sound bites and stuff. And yeah. he, all of a sudden, we're sort of going, oh, who's this guy? And why is he saying that? What, what's your take on that? Has he always been like that, just privately? And, and, and should he take to Twitter and, and say that? I mean, listen, he's certainly free to do what he wants. It's America and stuff. But it's sort of weird for fans to see this from Paul. JR, what's your take on it, considering you knew them back then, where my, my initial guess would be that back then they just didn't know any press to keep the mystique up? And the, and yeah. The... Well, you know, Paul Paul has always been the quietest one yeah. in the band. He, he, he let his music speak for, for itself. Yeah, for and, 39 uh, years, that's what he did. Yeah. yeah exactly. And, and you know, but Paul, Paul and Gene really um, are the two... Uh, examples of the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of thing. Actually, Paul is. Gene is, Gene is a demon on stage at all. Yeah, Gene is Gene. I, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. He's, he's the same guy. Um, maybe a bit more gregarious with the makeup on, but Paul is the one who, who really underwent the greatest transformation mm -hmm. once he put on the makeup and, and, and hit the stage. And, and, and it was a wonderful thing, but... That that outgoing uh, front man showman type thing was was not Paul's side, and uh, you know I I haven't spoken to the man since 1976. I'll be honest with you. Jesus. Uh, um, yeah. But it would it would seem to me if I had to guess, I would think that he's comfortable now and and where he is at this point in his life, he's certainly got enough cash that he doesn't have to worry about. Um, you know, harming himself uh, financially by by 
speaking his mind. And, uh, you know, quite honestly, uh, it, it, it's cool, but, but the, uh, you know, I don't know what he means that Macy screwed him over. Perhaps they thought that they would have a, a, a more uh, garish uh, float and be given more time or, or whatever. But, you know, they, they knew what they were getting themselves into. They weren't in control. This is, a, this is an event that's going on for decades. Yeah. And, and, and they did it because they wanted the exposure. Bottom line, they got the exposure. And if he didn't like it, um, I think um, re- really it's almost neither here or there because it wasn't it wasn't about how they. Uh, uh, no, it was about being in the major day parade. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, it was about it was about how the the audience that watched it both live and and, and on TV uh, saw it. And, and I think uh, I think, and she, I think it, go. No, I, I think as far as that's concerned, you know, they they. they they got out of it what what they wanted to get out of it. They were seen by tens of millions of people, mm-hmm. and they they had their few moments, you know. So there you go. Yeah, I mean, I think his main take was, and, I, and I, you know, it's funny you say. I mean, he is comfortable with himself. Finally, he did the book. I think I read somewhere someplace where that was why he did it. He's finally comfortable. Why not say my side of the story? Right. Now, sometimes mm-hmm. when you've been sure. quiet for years, you may have. Um, you may let more stuff go than you norm- uh, that you normally would have because you've never let it go before. So these right. tweets, there's all the sort of instant stuff you can say. Um, right. I'm definitely somebody who shoots his mouth off first, and then <laughs> thinks uh, later. Then, or actually, has a great success of saying things and and them being correct or sarcastic or whatever, is them being accepted. But occasionally, that leads to a problem of being. Oh shit! That one wasn't right. You're gonna to have to pay for that one because you're you, you're you're pretty good at saying what you want to say, but then you get too good at it, and you'll, that's when you make mistakes. So, right. I'm, but I'm also right. the king of apologizing. <laughs> yeah, <I laughs> somehow, mean, I, somehow, and people accept them all. I'm, I'm with Jr. on this. I don't really know how they got screwed by the Macy's Day Parade. If they did, I, my feeling is that they probably shouldn't have been there with drums and instruments. They probably should have just been in their coats on a float, waving to the fans while the music played in the background. But. Yeah, uh, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You got to agree, they 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 did get screwed. You, you know, it was a little pretentious for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to say it's got to be only the four and not the other ones. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was pretentious of them to say you're going to play with makeup with with these guys or not at all. I mean, you know, if you're going to invite somebody to your house, don't lock them out. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know, it was, it was I, I, I think Paul is just, just finally saying what he, you know, the things he, he feels when he wants to. And the thing is, uh, uh, and it's true, Jr. He definitely is the shy guy. He always was. Whether you think he is or now or not, he definitely is. He, when sure. we used to hang in the '80s at the China Club in those days and stuff, and I had my other friends with Billy Squire and all these other guys and stuff. Paul would always ask me, "How do you? How can you write songs?" that expose who you are. I mean, that's something I never could understand. And he and Billy, I sat with him and Billy down at the table one night to discuss it. Because, you know, Billy writes, whatever he wrote, that was him. It was, mm-hmm. it was, there was no, there was no cathartic, it was cathartic, but in other words, Paul used to say, well, the guy on stage is not me. It says, this is me. The quiet guy is me. So for him, it was part of the act and stuff like that. I'm sure the lyrics and stuff of the songs are, are there's more deeper meaning there's and stuff. And some you have to take it from someplace. He's not just watching television writing a song about uh, about Mannix or something. So, so yeah, those Mannix. are part of him. Those are part of him. But he uh, but he definitely chose to keep his personas different. Uh, Jr. W- when you're penning and writing out on the streets. You were privy to all kinds of information. You know all kinds of secrets. How do you decide what goes in the book and what you sort of say, you know what, they fired me and I haven't spoken to him since 76, but I still have a loyalty and i got to keep this stuff under wraps. Uh, how, how do you decide what goes in and what just can't? Well, you know, Mitch, the, the reality is this book... Um you know, we, we we prefaced this whole conversation in the beginning with talking about, you know, uh, how the band members have have uh, spoken about other band members disparagingly mm-hmm. and things like that. You know, and this is this was not anything other than our true recollections of of what went on. You know, there's a lot of things that people ask us about. But quite frankly, you know, we were not aware of. We spoke in, 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 in out on the streets exactly from what we knew and and nothing else. And if we didn't know enough about it, we didn't write about it. Okay. You know? 
Uh, so in that instance, it was it was very easy to uh, to be to be straightforward and, and honest with it. You know what I mean? But like I say, you know, in in the early years, uh, 74, 75, and 76, they were four great guys. They were united in the thought that they were going to take over the music world and conquer it and, and, and scale to the height, which is what they did. Now, I'll be honest with you, you know, unfortunately, the crew was, was relieved of duty, if you will, um, before we were able to share in, you know, the real peaks of their success being 78, 79, you know, that, that whole era. Um, but I like to think that, you know, had the crew uh, been around um, when, when the wheels started to come off the bus, that maybe, you know, maybe our presence there and maybe the, the, the presence of, of guys that knew them you know, when they were just Gene, Paul, Peter, and Ace, and mm-hmm. Matt the Demon, the Spaceman, et cetera, et cetera, running around calling him Mr. Simmons and Mr. Stanley or whatever the hell they called him. You know, the, 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 we might have been able to help keep them a little bit more grounded and focused on uh, remembering who they were and, and how they got to the point that they, that, that they, that they did wind up at, you know? Yeah, I, you know, I um, agree with that assessment because... When you've been with somebody and you know them on that sort of a, and maybe this is not the proper word, but intimate level where you know this is how Gene mm-hmm. is, this is how Ace is, when they start acting a little big-headed or whatever, you, you, you're the kind of guys that in 1979 could have come in and just said, listen, don't fuck with me. I know who you exactly. are. Stop it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I mean, Jesus Christ, guys, you know, you, you work so hard to get to this point now. Don't let your egos you know, uh, t- uh, tear this apart, you know, and I, and I really think that we could have helped to do that, but um, we weren't around, and, and, and I guess we'll never know. You know, Mitch, you worked on the solo albums, which, since we're talking about egos, in a sense, is sort of ego projects. Was there a sense of, I have to do better than Ace, I have to, my album has to be better than Peter's, I have... Yeah, uh, if this works out, I'm gonna go solo. No, there was no talk of that at all on Ace, on, at least on Gene's record sessions and stuff when we were working on them there. He made an eclectic record, which, by all means, is probably the best pop record. And the the biggest surprise was Ace's uh, song doing better <laughs> than anybody's. Um, but he, Gene, had this hodgepodge through it. All. This was basically him and Sean Delaney doing whatever the hell they ever wanted to do. Um, and he was happy with it, and he was. And it was truly. Really, he was just a fun record for him. Um, whether I, they, they never really displayed the egos. And uh, let's go forward a few years to eighty three, four, and five, and up to eighty nine when I was like best friends with just Paul and Gene. By then, right. running that show. Um, um, was it eighty four or eighty five? Somewhere in that range. I was the guy that was friends with both of them. Right. On the best friend level to the point where the people in the office go, what the hell is this about? Because they don't have any friends that they shared. And that must have been hard because... I, well, I, to me, it wasn't hard. I just didn't understand it to the point until somebody pointed out to me, you know, you're friends with both of them. So the thing is, the two of them, by then they are, I think the two of them, no matter what they'd gone through, I mean, I can't remember the eggs of a bill, except I remember going to visit them. When they did the, when they did the elder, Bill was still involved, went mm-hmm. to the offices in the city. It's funny, I walk in the office and there's Billy Idol with Steve Stevens trying to get go. them to work that band. And, and, Bill, and Steve taking me aside saying, hey, can I be in your band? I'm going, you don't want to be in my band. I can't pay you. So, <laughs> and, uh, I said, kid, don't go with me. I can't pay you. I got enough money for myself. I guess, and I decided to just, just be a writer and hang out and, and, and stuff like that. So I, um, I didn't do my career very well either, guys. I could have used JR around the time. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so I, um, well, it's not too late. We got you both on the happen. phone. I remember the very good. Uh, I just said it's not too late. We've got you both on the phone yes, now. Well, you, you can make a deal after. We work for the same sort of. We work for the same company now. I'm gonna definitely asking for guidance in this one. Trust me. Absolutely. <laughs> so let's get back to the story. So it was eighty four, eighty five. So I'm sitting in there with them, and the Bill Coin has this Christmas party at Paul's, at his, was it his apartment? Yeah, it was his apartment. It was, like, amazing. I mean, Christopher Walton comes walking through the door. It was just right after he had been involved with that whole thing with Natalie Wood and Bob Wagner and her drowning. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Bruce, well, all these different names and actors you you knew were coming through, including Stephen, Stephen Collins and all these different people. And, this, and we're, watching, we're watching the Academy Awards. That's what we're doing at his house. So everybody who's still around then, Ace and Peter were not at that party. 
um, I guess Ace, uh, when I was doing when I was doing Animalize, they were trying to buy Ace out of his deal, and that's when I went to go find Bruce in the in the Queen's phone phone books because they couldn't find Bob. So my job at Right Track was to find Bruce Kulick and get him in the studio. So they were still they were still a duo then. They were still doing the stuff, and they, of course Glickman Marx were managing them. And as it turned out years later, and I'm sure it's public by now that uh, when they fired uh, Carl, I mean. Uh, yeah, Marx uh, and Glickman. It was because they were leasing all their equipment back to them in the offices for years, even though they bought it outright. I mean, there's all the stuff that came out afterwards. And then, of course, they entered the shrink phase, and that was the worst phase ever. But, uh, you know, when, when they got back big again after Animalize, that's when uh, uh, Marx became um, very egotistical and hugely uh, nasty to Polygram. Uh, and all this stuff came out later. They didn't know that their their representatives were, were fine. They, their representatives are more egotistically happy to be back than the band was. The band was happy to get their, their stuff back and their and their glory back and tour. But I listened. To, I usually hear phone calls of, with such obnoxious superiority from the management people, or even Gene's personal assistants, who he had to let go because they thought they were more. They thought they were him, just because they controlled right. the keys of the kingdom and the phones. There was a couple of people. Uh, Claire McCurry was probably the best person there at the tail end of that period, and she left to go work for Billy Joel and whatever she does now. But before that, there was somebody before her, and I said to Gene, what happened to her? He said, well, she was using my role that can call on people and not giving me messages and all this other stuff. It's like, you know, sometimes that can happen. Jerry, I'll tell you. you know, the band becomes huge, and the people around the band are misrepresenting the band, and the band doesn't need to know it. Well, actually, let me ask you about that, Jr. When the band was starting to rise when you were there, were, were there people on the crew that started taken advantage or started started maybe overstepping their bounds and, and taking things you know not not really of course there were there were there were minor offenses you know one or two guys that let go because they got caught uh wearing Paul's makeup and costume for example one, one night when they were in town and wanted to show off for their friends things like that My, <laughs> minor stuff but we really had a we really had a very tight ship until, like Mitch just mentioned. I mean, Glickman Marx came in and, and shit just changed overnight. It became that type of backstabbing. Everybody that was around before them were all of a sudden looking over their shoulders. Who's watching me do this? Who's who's doing that? And it, and it was very funny because individuals came in who represented themselves and who were represented as knowing more about the business uh, than we did. And I, I could never figure out how that was possible, being as they had never done what we'd done. They hadn't done over 300 shows in two and a half years and ate, slept, breathed, drank with these guys and went through, uh, you know, the, the, the tough times as well as, as, as the, 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 the good times, you know. They'd never um, worked on shows with the uh, with the technical uh, 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 high tech uh, situation of the tours that we did with every night with the flash pod and the explosions and the, you know, it's all, one thing all, to, all of this it's, stuff. It's one know? thing to look at things on an economic and a business level. The business models are there, and the econ economics are there, and the guy with the degree is there, or the guy that's worked in the straight field is there. Let's t take a look at. And I don't mean this in any bad way. Guitar centers accounting terms on how to get them going, and yet they've totally lost their edge as a music store. Um, it's and, and and they've paid for it hugely. There is, you know, as as he's saying, as Jared says, okay, you know how to what a flash pot does, you know what this does, you know what that does, you know what happens if it goes right. What do you do when it fails? Right. That's right. That's I mean, right. I'd be happy to, you know, if you could tell me what you do when it doesn't work, what do we do now? How, what do you do to make it happen? What do we do to get it going right now and then we'll worry about fixing everything for the future after the show? But the show must go on, so how do you do this? What do you do? Right. Yeah. Right. You know, and and are you aware that if you do this, this, and this, that you might alienate the guy that you didn't even know was important down the line, like the guy who's going to make sure he picks up the band? <laughs> you know, you know, and, and that's not even on our crew. It's the guy we hired in Peoria. Well, you've, you've, you've talked so nasty to the dispatcher that he's going to make sure the truck never shows up. Right. I mean, true. You know, 
it's it, it's and that's what happens when it t- when it takes over. Now, speaking I mean, of good times, I, I want to ask you this, Jr. You were there in the when the band recorded "Alive," which is arguably the best live album ever made, or certainly the best Kiss live album ever made. Um, sure. But listen, they they recorded, uh, I believe, three shows for it. Um, Eddie Kramer has gone on record as saying. And it didn't sound so good. We had to fix stuff. Um, what can you tell me about the original recordings? Uh, did you get a chance to hear them before it went to an album? Were they that bad that they needed all this fixing? Or could they have gone out and had this more raw energy? Just tell me a little bit about mm-hmm. putting together the project and, and the good, the bad, and, and what eventually yeah. became. Well, let, let me just say this. Every live album is sweetened. Um, Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. after the fact, anyone that says that their album is 100% live is full of shit. Right. They're 100% uh, lying. <laughs> yeah, stroking their egos, and it, it just doesn't happen that way. Absolutely. The, the only one that I can think of that might be true is that giant conglomeration of cheap trick demos that were put out right. by the band from well, just for their fans. They did something mm-hmm. like okay. a million tracks okay. and whatever. No, but I'm just saying, and even that may have been sweetened, but it probably was EQ more than anything else. Yeah, but, but, uh, right, right. Yeah, but yeah. as soon as you get but, it into the but, studio between mastering and mixing, it, it's no longer live. So so that that's, it's a truth. Yeah. Well, well the, the, essence, the essence of a live um, is, uh, is and was uh, the energy that, that happened on stage. That, that was captured. Uh, yes. I have to tell you that, and we talk about this in the book, what would happen is we would do a recording in one particular night. Um, Eddie Kramer would be in the, uh, in the truck, you know, during the recording, and he'd be taking notes, you know. Okay, uh, three seconds or five seconds into the bridge of this song, you know, there's a, it's a horrible note that just sticks out and doesn't belong. And there'd be pages and pages of notes, and the band would come in uh, at the next gig, and come in early before sound check and, and, and go straight to the truck and sit in the truck, sit in on a stool. You'd give Gene his bass or Paul his guitar, whatever. Okay, roll it, and they ran the tape right back to that particular uh, 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 verse or whatever it was, and okay, punch in, and they'd fix it right then and there. It's right. not like it's not like people went back and they recorded whole songs and then dubbed the uh, audience reactions over it or anything like that. That was my cast album. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, hey, but you yeah, know what? Is, uh, no, actually, album. our cast album, our cast album, we didn't record the whole songs. Though. We just we just dubbed in the same audience loop. The same whistle appeared every like five minutes. The like, swell <laughs> you kept putting in. But you know what? What's impressive about that with the punching back in those days? is that it required, for the most part, physically cutting in tape. It's not like today where the Pro Tools, where you just fly something in and it's a two-second... Right. I mean, that, that was right. major surgery back then. Right. Sure was, sure. They were... The razor blades came out, they were, like you say, they were cutting tape precisely and, you know, uh, doing... Of course, you know, in, in, in that, and, and Mitch, I'm sure you're aware, you know, when you, when, you, when you record like that, you keep a certain number of tracks open just so that you can go back and punch in and do those things and... And, 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 and pull down, you know, that, that uh, guitar flub on, on, uh, right, you know, right. on, on track nine and replace it with the repair track that's on track 10 or whatever it is. And, um, you know, when that's done seamlessly, as, as in the case, a lot in a live, uh, you wind up with, like you say, one of the greatest live albums of all time. But Absolutely. For, for, for all intents and purposes, a live captured very accurately the raw energy and power that came off of that stage each and every night. And um, it was really, really great to be a part of that, i got to tell you. Well, let me the band you... back, this, what year was that was live? 75. 75. 75 when, yeah. when I went to see them, after we met them in 76, and when I went to see them, I, I think my only Kiss concert back in that era of, with all four of them was in early January of 77, I think. Uh, they invited us to the garden shows. Out of out of the blue, we just got an invite to go to see them at the garden. Uh, I don't care what anybody says about their playing abilities and stuff like that. That show live to me was just unbelievable. I don't care if they were sloppy, if they weren't great, or who knows what. It just was. It was the band. It was everything that made it got them to where they were supposed to have gone 
not just a pot, not just a smoke. You know, you can have smoke and mirrors all day long if the band sucks and ain't going to go. We've we've That's seen right. that with boy bands. We've seen that with every sort of recording artist who's got a great looking show, but the sound is terrible. Yeah. yeah. And then everybody that has, has reinforced sound or tracks and stuff like that, the press goes gunning for them just to wreck the career. You know, but uh, but it's not as bad you as know it what? was back in those days. I like when a live show, ha any live band, has a bit of warts and some feedback because then you know it's live. It's when you go there and it sounds perfect, then you have to say, "Hmm, did I just see?" You know, a lip sync performance here. Like, why is it so perfect? So I, I like the little mistakes. Um, I like it when Paul. I don't know if Paul did it in the early day, early days, but you know, they started a song wrong. You would just stop it and go, okay, start again. The whole yep. audience would love every That's second true. of it, yep. and they'd start again. I saw it a bunch of times in the '80s. It was just like, you know, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> you start it again, huh? and, they, right. and, the, and the band should be laughing at each other as opposed to get somebody getting pissed off. Why just stop it? Why? Because we made a mistake. Let's start again for Christmas. Uh, let me ask you this one, Jr. Again about a live. There's been a lot of, you know, fairy tales and all this about the the album about Peter Chris's drum solo that he was going to quit the band if that drum solo wasn't on a live. Was there really any controversy about getting this drum solo on or off live, or is that just sort of fairy tales that fans have made up over the last 40 years? Well, Peter was always fighting for every moment of recognition that he could get. Okay. You know, you know he really, he, 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 was, he was very adamant about that. You know, you got to remember in the early days, and maybe a lot of people don't know, but in the early days, back when they were doing the, the, the Coventry and the Daisy and clubs like that, um, you, Peter was the voice of KISS. Right. Peter was the one that was actually, you know, uh, communicating with the audience. And, and Yeah, he, and was the, he was the guy talking, for, he, was the, he was the guy who talked from the, from, from the, from the drums. Yeah. yeah, which was very strange right. because I've heard some of those earlier recordings and Paul is completely absent and you go, well, why is your front man not talking, so that must have been a very strange thing to see them in '74 with Peter well, talking. Well, no, by no, by the time '74 came around, uh, Bill and, and Sean had had uh, relieved Peter of those duties, and and <laughs> they spent a lot of time working with Paul. Virtually, I won't say everything, but a lot of the things uh, that came out of Paul's mouth, even to this day had their roots in, uh, in Sean Delaney. Did, you know, did, uh, did they yeah, really, Sean. did they really sort of cut you off, but did they really say to, to Peter, or was there a band meeting where they said, listen, you got to shut up there. You're not, you're not working. We need, we need something better. I mean, was it, was it that kind of almost rudeness or forwardness where they said, yeah, no, not working. Or was it like, well, hey, no, we just need to develop the front man and, yeah, I don't think that they really got in his face okay. and, 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 you know, told him in, in those words. Right. But over, over a course of time, um, you know, Paul took over more and more of those duties until a point where, you know, Peter didn't open his mouth unless he was singing Black Diamond or Deuce or something like that. Well, not that, not Deuce. Or Beth. Black or Diamond or, or, or Beth. Yeah, well, yeah, well, whatever, you know. So, so it, 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 just, it just morphed into it. And, you know, being a drummer myself and, and, and being around, having worked for as many bands as I, as I have, you know, you really have to look at it. You know, a front man is just that, a front man. And I, I would almost defy anybody to name five hugely successful groups where the drummer was the front man. You know, it, it, it doesn't happen. They're, they're, yeah. they're the farthest, they're the farthest person in the group away from the audience they're stuck in the back and you know uh, uh, while these other individuals are are not tethered down to one place like a drummer is you know it, it's natural that uh, your guitar player or your bass player or, or your lead singer yes. the one that's got total access to the width of the entire stage and and the closest to the to the audience but those are going to be the guys that that really uh interact with the audience the most so it um i, th I think it was a good thing oh, yeah absolutely a good thing no not not criticizing it at all uh, you know you yeah. need the guy out there who's going to have the, the more direct contact with the audience or the front row to be in charge um you said peter was always fighting for recognition why do you feel he needed to fight for rec was it just 
he just was insecure, or did the band make him feel like, eh, you're nothing, we'll replace you next week if you don't shut up? I mean, was it more, where where did that come from? Or is it just, listen, uh, you fight for uh, what's I, yours? Yeah, no, I, I think it was was insecurities, okay. you know, rightful, rightfully or wrongfully so. You know, um, Peter, <laughs> and there are a lot of uh, discussions about this, uh, you know, on both sides of the fence, Peter's the Without uh, Kiss, you know, without Peter, uh, uh, you know, Kiss wouldn't be Kiss. And then the other side, that, you know, Peter's not the most technical drummer in the world, et cetera, et cetera. Doesn't matter. Uh, so, yeah, so there was, always, there was always that. And I have to tell you, as a, as, a, as a former drummer myself, when you've got to go on stage after a guy like Neil Perk gets up off the drum kit, um, <laughs> yeah. it, it can be a little challenging. You have to be very confident in the fact that you're bringing more to the table than just that, you know, over-the-top technical ability. You know, there's there's the showmanship and everything else involved. And then, of course, Peter had that great voice, you know, that that great soulful voice, you yeah. know. Yeah. But uh, but he was he was it, it it took a while to for him to feel comfortable. Um, in controlling his drum solos and really getting the type of reaction from the crowds that that uh, the drum solos around him uh, got and, and and what his finally became in the end. But uh, yeah, it, it, it was it was uh, it was a bit of insecurity, I think. But uh, you know, here again, man, I I love the guy, and um, I'm, I'm I'm happy for him all. I just want to go back real quick because. You mentioned earlier about uh, about Ace and his current show. Yeah. I recently saw Ace in New York. Right, and you that's introduced right, him. That's right. Yeah, I, I did. I I introed him, and it was my great pleasure to do that. I hadn't seen I hadn't seen Ace actually. Um, Nick Campisi and I saw him about I guess it's six or seven years ago uh, when he came through New York, um, uh, and before then I hadn't seen him since '76 and. His show back on uh, November 24th was the strongest show. I mean, it was phenomenal. The band was great. Yep. His voice, even though he's not a, a an over-the-top uh, vocalist, his voice was very, very strong. His playing was was uh, cleaner mm-hmm. and more forceful than ever. And I got to tell you, the band sounded as good or better than Kiss ever sounded. You know, so yeah, so I, I really, ha- I really have to say that I was very, very happy for Ace. We spoke at length backstage, and you know, it, w- it was good to be able to speak with him and, and have him participate in the conversation. And mm-hmm. you know, he seems to be very, very happy and, and at peace, you know, with himself. And, and I, I'm real happy to uh, to report that because you know he's, he's yeah, a the, great all these, guy. Yeah, all these posts of him uh, and all the, how the cool the shows are going. It's just fantastic. And it's you know fantastic. what? It's got to be, um, I don't want to say legitimate, but so many people over the years have, have taken shots at Ace just because he's the guy for I the said, I don't have it. They took it away from me. What's the matter with you? Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, Mitch, you still there? I'm still here. Well, uh, I don't know. JR, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, Sorry. Okay, good. Uh, let me just uh, get quickly get back to a live and and you said that they were recording a lot of shows at the time and they would go into the truck after. Is there this this a whole vault of like a hundred shows recorded? Not not necessarily for a live, but just were they recording a lot for for just practice purposes or to have them for posterity or is there a vault of all of nineteen seventy five shows or nineteen seventy four shows? Yeah, well, well, when you tell you there are two types of recordings, you know, there, there are the board tapes, you know, they recorded, they used to record every show wow. uh, from from the board, and they'd get back together, especially in the early days, they, they'd get together after the show and somebody's room somewhere and, and, and listen to the show and critique and, you know, resequence songs and, you know, drop a lot of songs. There were songs that people asked me about, do you ever remember the band playing this song or that song? And Honestly, you know, I, I I can't remember because some songs if they played them, and they didn't work after after two or three uh, attempts, they never got played again. Yeah. You know. 
Um, those those were songs song. that I wrote. I never heard them again either. <laughs> 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 and they, 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 they did get all you can take at the Donington, and they did it somewhere else, and then it didn't work live on stage, and that was it. Wow. That, that was it, yeah, because it was it was all it was always about, you know, that major shock effect and, and you know, building the best show possible. Now, the multi, multi-track shows, um, you know, which are the shows uh, shows that were recorded on, uh, you know, with the with the with the record plant truck and shows recorded specifically to uh, to be considered for for live albums and stuff like that. Yeah, they they recorded they recorded a bunch of shows. You know, um, a lot of uh, it, it shouldn't be surprising that you know the live album, for example, is not. You know, one show. One show, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. There were songs. There were songs from from several different shows in there that were uh, that were put in because uh, you know they they might have been great one night uh, and the performance of that same song the next night not not. And it could have been technical. Good. It could have been technical issues and all other reasons why they pull these things. Yeah, exactly. When you're making a live album, you got to put the best foot forward, which which is perfectly reasonable, if you ask me. Um, yeah, sure. Do you think those uh, those shows that they that they had? Tape still exist today, and you ever think they'll they'll see the light of day if they do? I mean, is that something they kept, or would they listen to it back and then erase it and tape again the next night? Knowing Gene, there's probably, they probably exist somewhere, but and if he ever could think of another way to market it, then we'll hear them. <laughs> well, I think the marketing would be easy. You just throw them up on Kiss Online, say here twenty bucks a shot, you get a download. I'm sure there's thousands of Kiss fans that would willingly pay. To get, For I mean, sure. the, the, the demos are out there. I mean, my, I've heard my music demos up on all those different Kiss sites and stuff like that, and people download. I've yeah. even downloaded some of my stuff as well. So, yeah. stuff that gets out the door can be can be gotten hold of. Whether there's any official sort of release like that, yeah. uh, it, it, who knows? They, it, you know, and amazingly, they may have thought, okay, we've got enough, we've released enough of this stuff now. Yeah, but um, good market. Mitch, you, we've yeah. talked about this before. Uh, you were thinking once of putting together a writer's version album of all the Kiss songs you've written. How have we progressed on that? Are we, we, we getting... have, I think we've left it where our last discussion was. <laughs> <laughs> it's not exactly happening. <laughs> oh, someday. Someday. Someday, gotta... yes, exactly. Someday I should do it. At least something on iTunes or something like that, but I never seem to get myself together to do them. Um, although I, all I, did, I, did tell, I did tell Mitch that half of my demos in the 80s all have Eric Carr's drum tracks on them. Because Gene, in his wisdom, to write songs... With the feel of the band, would would take he took three albums worth of drum drum tracks of Eric's off of those things, converted them to cassette, or always high quality with Gene, um, mm-hmm. and <laughs> this, we would, we would use those to do our demos. So I mean, I have like ten songs with licking up drum tracks. I have like three songs nice. with all hell's breaking loose. I have all, <laughs> and I still have the drum track somewhere. I think but it's a, that's, that's but, great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that with the money that was spent. To uh, to bring in a high quality uh, mobile recording uh, unit like like uh, Record Plant or, or whatever else that might have been used uh, between now and then, I'm sure those tapes are available uh, or, or at least in the possession of, of Gene or Paul or, or someone who are guarding them very very closely. You don't spend you know thousands and thousands of dollars. And then uh, Just throw don't they out. still have that lose, big giant, lose, lose, lose track of the tapes? You know, don't they still have the big giant warehouse upstate with all the sets and everything else in it too? I mean, that was storage for years in there, at least in right. the eighties. Now, right, yeah. now we we've reached the one hour mark. Do we uh, do we keep going or do we we say thank you and think about doing a part two at some point? Well, I haven't seen a lot of nasty looks from my 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 bosses here, so I think <laughs> we could go a little more, or we could do a second version. It's up to us. Yeah, I mean, it's up to you, Jerry. Whatever works for you, whatever works for you, man. I'm good. Well, why don't we give it another uh, ten or fifteen minutes? And uh, because at some point, I don't know if, if everybody's going to want to sit through a two-hour show. I know, I know, we can usually get to about seventy-five minutes comfortably. Um, cool. Well, you know, since Mitch just mentioned the warehouse, there there has been again in in lore of Kissdom this fantastical warehouse that exists in somewhere land. Uh, what is in that warehouse? Has anybody seen it recently? I mean, you must have seen it in the seventies, Jr. And Mitch, maybe Paul or Gene took you out to it in the in the eighties. What what's in there? Jr. I have not seen it. Okay. I I yeah. have not seen it. 
Um, I've heard a lot of stories. I'm sure that um, whatever is there is now very tightly guarded. Uh, I've heard stories of certain individuals uh, gaining access and, you know, selling a lot of the, the contents and things like that unbeknownst to right. the band members. So uh, whether it still exists in the form that it did back in the day, I don't know, but uh, it may it may uh, have been I, moved into different storage facilities. I mean, um, I never right. saw it either. Same thing. Right. The only, my only glimpse yeah. of the fact that there was some storage place somewhere, and I think I told you the story once um, on one of, one of the interview, Mitch, was that when I went Passover Seder one year around. Um, the uh, I was in Great Neck. Jean's mom, of course, Florence lives in New High Park. Unless she's moved from there, mm-hmm. she could still be there for all I know. Um, I got a phone call from Jean. Nobody had cell phones. We all had everybody's home phone numbers. So she called me at my mom's house to say, "Why don't you and your wife come over for for dessert?" So we walk over there, and aside from seeing uh, what's her name, Roseanne, and uh, and what's his name, Glickman, and right. uh, was it Marx? I can't remember who Roseanne out was. Shall not. Um, was Diana Ross, Jean at the head of the table, Diana's ex-husband and the kids at the end around the table, uh, Lisa Black, Lisa, you know, Lisa, whatever, Hartman Black now mm-hmm. with Paul, everybody around this big table. I'm going, what the hell am I doing here? Um, but <laughs> at the end of dinner, on the table in the, in the foyer, when you walk into the front door, um, is these comic books wrapped on the table. And it's action number one, or it's whatever. It's all the stuff that you see and know they're worth a fortune. Right. And they're just all hanging out on the table wrapped in plastic. I'm going to Gene, are you, are these? He goes, yeah, those are real. So I'm just having them sent up to the warehouse, but I wanted to pick a few out before they all got warehoused. So I knew there was some place, but it sounds like Raiders of Lost Ark or something. Whatever. <laughs> you'll, you'll never, there's a vault somewhere where this stuff was in there. So we're like, oh my God, it's close to I've ever come to one of those comics in my life. Right. But, it, you know, it's him, so, it it's it, somewhere it, in a silo in North Dakota. It could be, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, since we're going to wrap up in the next 10 minutes here, just what are some... Each one of you, what what is your greatest sort of kiss story? Whether it's a personal thing that you and Gene went for a you know a, a falafel somewhere or a, a great concert, just uh, Jr. What's what's sort of your greatest kiss story, memory, whatever you want to call it? Wow, you know I I've never really thought of one great story. I just I just think about that. That, that magic carpet ride from January '74 through yeah. to through to uh, June of '76, and how, like I say, the band and 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 Mitch, you you'll appreciate this because you know no band has uh, reached the heights that Kiss has reached uh, as quickly, especially mm-hmm. without a hit record. Yeah. You know, by the time Beth came out and was their their breakout hit, it, and it's so funny that their their largest hit should be a, a, a ballad type. Right. But uh, um, you know, until that song came out, it was all about the live performance. And I and I guess for me, as as a as a as a, as a road dog, uh, and I and I talk about it in the book, the greatest thing for me is looking out, is being in the wings and looking out into a packed stadium and realizing that if there's 20,000 people out in that stadium, that the reason that they came, got dressed up and came out that evening was due in part to what I had to contribute, the rest Mm -hmm. of the crew had to contribute, and the band had to contribute to making 20,000 people really happy yeah you know and there, there's no greater feeling than that to know that you've contributed to a, a, a memorable time for for, for for so many people so so for me that is that's my greatest memory um there are a couple of sex and drugs and rock and roll stories in the book <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but 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 it really is it, it's really it's really about that 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 whole uh, uh, getting the love back from the audience and really knowing, you know, and and, and having it, having that that love, you know, fed directly back to you 
in the form of applause and, and shouts and, and, and everything else. There's, there's nothing better, man. Absolutely. Would it be, uh, would it be uh, rude for me to ask you to just to give me that one Kiss stage intro that you wanted the best? Oh, sure. Why not? Can I, Why can not? I hear that? Ready? I'd love to hear it live. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you can hear it. You can hear it. Here it goes. All right. You are the best and you got it. Ah, ah! Can we do that again, Jr.? Like the tape cut out. Oh no! Yes, it cut out. <laughs> Your mic cut out. Oh my god! It's a, well, it's I might a, have blown the mic you. out. You know that that yeah. happens. Uh, you might exactly. You know? well, uh, That's a problem yeah, with recording yeah. equipment. I know. <laughs> Let's see if we can try it one more time. And if it doesn't work, eh, so be it. I'll hold. I'll hold back a little bit. All right. All right. You ready? Yeah. Okay, man. You wanted the best and you got it. The hottest man in the land. Yes. There you go. Beautiful. That's, That's beautiful. Fantastic. That's what we like. And uh, quickly, Mitch, you, you were there for, for the 80s mostly or, or for most of the 80s. Um, what's your sort of a great story? And it could be sort of one of these uniting stories. It doesn't have to be sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Just anything. What do you got? Um I think, uh, as J.R. said, sometimes seeing those shows and seeing everybody going great. To me, for me, knowing the two of them and their friendship and how many years they, they were together and for Gene and Paul and, and how many years they had to stay apart from each other to maintain the friendship, to see them... Uh, one of my most fond memories, I think I told you this, is they're rehearsing for a tour in the 80s and they're in the big giant soundstage and that's how Gene's reading, the, Paul's reading the New York Post and they're going over song lists and Gene goes through, he says, I don't want to do that song and I can't remember what the song was. I was made for and, loving you most likely. Uh, no, no, it wasn't that. It was definitely a, uh, it was one of his, uh, one oh, of, um, was it Burn, Bitch, Burn? No, it wasn't even that. It was something that was on the song list and okay. stuff like that. But the, and the guys are going through listening. He goes, I don't want to do that song. And Paul just looked up from the paper, seemingly not paying any attention. He goes, you will play that song. And he goes, he says, and he, Gene goes, why? He says, are you crazy? That is a song and everybody expects it and you do it great. You're going to play that song. So they, they, if, they were there for the checks and balances all the time. But for me, maybe the proud papa moment of watching them sing Mr. Make Believe, which is, goes back to the beginning, I mean, uh, on, on the Unplugged show, and hearing them just those stupid, stupid ahs, and that was me. I mean, it's like I'm going like, holy shit, it made it to the, it made it to the record. It made it, it, made it to, the, to the history books. I mean, they're, they're, they're doing everything they can do during Unplugged, and they're playing that song. So it's the, the, the moments of the two of them being, listening to the two of them talk about each other's foibles in private i mean as i said the mo the thing where when we would, would hang out together almost all the time but either either i uh, either i was with gene or i was with paul and us having an arrangement you don't tell paul what we did and i won't and paul <laughs> and you don't tell me what you and paul did and yet and in moments of weakness they both say come on tell me what you did last night i'm not telling you <laughs> that kept their friendship separate and it kept them something for themselves, and I didn't tread that line. So it was. Uh, it you, was. You were never asked to spy. Paul never said, "Hey, listen." No, but, they, no, but they, something. We had this arrangement. That, you know, I would appreciate it if you didn't tell Gene what we did last night. If, if we're talking about something that's like <laughs> personal, um, something you would think best friends would talk about, but at a certain point in time, best friends aren't best friends anymore because right. it's developed into a much yeah. longer relationship. So to protect it, I'd rather you didn't tell him what we talked about, and um, and it had nothing to do with keeping it away from Gene. It's just that this is our conversation. And Gene would say the same thing. And yet Gene would be the first one to call, come on, tell me what you did. I'm not telling you what we did. It wasn't even about what you talk about. It's like, what did you guys do? I said, I can't tell you. Ask him. So, and it was very, very comical. I mean, they'd be jumping up, hopping up and down like little kids. But if the three of us went out, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I mean, uh, it just was, I can't think of anything bad about it except for the, the, the you know when gene tells the story of you know he wanted to do television and projects and paul said no we only do kiss stuff and then the then the new england co album comes out and he produced it and then and gene says i thought we weren't supposed to do any projects <laughs> kiss stuff you know he says i have all these things of course he showed me the the, the reels of the, the the television policy he was doing it thank god they didn't go to air because as cheesy an actor as he is that those you are know, even cheesier you know, you know you're yeah. right i I've never thought about that, but a lot of fans have, have jumped on Gene for the 80s and saying, you went out and did this, you went out and did that, this movie and that movie. Yeah. But you're right, Paul is, is, is technically the one that strayed first. I mean, and it's not, yeah. it's not a major thing. I mean, uh, he no, it's what kept them. It's what keeps them together if they can have a life outside of it. What did, what did, 
what did Roger Daltrey say? You know, if we could have, if we could have done, our, if we had done solo albums, who might still be together or whatever the heck it is? I mean, it's like, you know, they they needed solo. Oh, he says that's right. They did solo albums, and that's why the band stayed together. But you're, but but I, ne- I never thought of that. You know, Paul did sort of throw throw out that first salvo, and and I guess Gene sort of went in the eighties. Well, hey, Paul could do it. I might well, well be specifically because Paul told them, no, you can't do anything else. It's all Kiss, and then New England came out before Gene even did Keel or any of that stuff. And I saw and New England. Do you know technically New England is the first band I ever saw? Because I saw Kiss on the Dynasty tour in 79. Right. And they were opened with New England. So that is technically the first huh. band I ever saw live. Well, well. <laughs> how were they? Uh, I remember thinking, because I was only 11, how old was I? 11, I guess? I remember thinking, yeah. wow, this is a show? Really? Yeah, <laughs> and I felt so, and I felt somewhat disappointed, and I really remember the feeling. And then Kiss came out, and I remember the sound and the the smoke and them rising slowly, and that just changed everything for me. Here I am, all these years later, wanting to still go to shows, and in fact, I'm going to some all all weekend. And I don't think had it not been for the Dynasty show and that sound, uh, I can't. I don't. Know, I, I don't know how you can describe that sound. That the, they. Uh... JR, maybe Paul had them turn the uh, the voltage regulators down. But they had a they had a rattle <laughs> going on. You know? Anyway, great great times. Uh, or Gene, of, Gene had them turn it down right now. Yeah. Speaking of great times, this was great. Always a pleasure to to, to speak with uh, either one of you, and, and especially both of you at the same time. Uh, there's definitely got to be a part two and a part three and a part four and. That's great. To well, you up, definitely have to. Talk. I definitely want to hear more about Jr.'s books. So do 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 some with him. <laughs> well, I think we got a lot of the book out on the streets. Of course, is out now, and and it's it's a yeah. great read. I've had a chance to go through it. There are some great stories, and I won't spill the beans because that's not what it's about. So go buy it and read it for yourself. And uh, you know, Mitch, uh, I'm waiting for your book, My Kiss Years. God, I got a. I really should just get a, buy myself a recorder and just start talking, which is something I'm very good at. Yeah. I'll have to have, I have to have somebody do an outline for me because I'll just stray and keep going. Yeah. There you go. We'll do there an addendum go. for the uh, Out on the Streets uh, soft cover release, and it'll be the Mitch Weissman years. There you go. There you go. <laughs> the soft it. cover is it. right. It could be, it could be the it. biggest soft cover ever. But uh, <laughs> at the same time, Jr., I'll, let's talk, let's, let's, I'll talk to you about some stuff I need shipped from New York. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, it's good talking to you, Mitch. Yeah. It's good sure, talking man. to you, too. And, then, and Mitch LaFont, as always, great talking to you. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you, man. Have a good one. You, too, now. Bye-bye. And there you have it, folks, my interview with Mitch Weissman and, of course, J.R. Smalling. J.R. has the new book, Out on the Streets, available everywhere from iTunes to Amazon to everywhere in between. Matt, always a pleasure uh, to have you join me on these things. Of course, you've got Burning Rain, you've got Mr. Big. Um, Anything else since I've last spoken to you? Any other projects coming up? Uh, I'm doing a couple records for Frontiers. which that's going to be announced shortly um, in January, and um, been hanging with the family and chilling, which is an interesting experience. I'm, yeah. I'm working on learning how to chill out, you know. <laughs> yeah, we just realized. Put the drumsticks under the bed, ma- under the mattress for a while. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, the people asked, "Do you have any hobbies?" I'm like, "Well, I collect records and listen to record." You know, it's like it's all music, all music related. So. Yeah, you know, and and of course with Frontiers, uh, they've been putting out, to me, a lot of great melodic rock albums, so I'm looking forward to whatever you're going to do with them. Uh, Where can people find you? Uh, Everything is Matt Star Music, and Star has two R's, so website is mattstarmusic.com, Facebook is Matt Star Music, and Twitter is Matt Star Music as well, and um, we've also got a line of t-shirts called Dr. Star's Mustache Apparel, and... um, I'm getting cleaned out for the holidays, which is great. There's a lot yeah. of people or, ordering stuff. And, and my dad finally, my dad goes, hey, when are you going to uh, send me one of those, those Dr. Star shirts? I said, oh, now I play with Mr. Big, and now you finally want one. <laughs> you know, he just, he's just waiting to, for me to play Budokan. And then once, once that happened, he goes, all right, I guess this kid's, you know, I'll, I'll rock his shirt now. But the question is, is if you play Budokan, will there be Matt Star at Budokan t-shirts? Hmm. Well, at Budokan, I wore, for the Mr. Big Tour, I had a shirt made up that said Pat, for Pat Torpy. It said Pat in uh, Japanese writing. So, 
I wore that as an ode to Pat. And uh, but yeah, Matt started live at Budokai. Yeah, well, you know, I'll let, let me get on Photoshop and see what I can do. That's a design for you. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Always a pleasure. And uh, you know, let's let's keep doing these. Uh, people, I got a lot of positive feedback from our um, first try at this with the Joe Perry interview. I got a few emails that said that Matt guy's really good. Bring him back. So here you are. Great. Well, all these years of geekdom and reading the back of album covers and repeatedly listening to things, it's it's finally paying off. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm glad you asked me and I have a good time doing this. So yeah, we'll do some more for sure. Fantastic. Thank you. You got it.